Tonight, the cold shoulder for hundreds of passengers stuck overnight in a Canadian airport famous for warm welcomes. Diverted, delayed, and forced to sleep on the floor. When we knew that we were going to be stuck there, it was really frustrating because the hotel we had booked was literally five minutes away. The anger and the apology from Canadian customs officials. No traitors in Parliament, according to a party leader who has seen the top secret report. I'm just begging my colleagues, particularly the leaders of the other parties, not to let this descend into a witch hunt. As allegations of another foreign misinformation campaign surface. No one in this country is above the law. Also, an unprecedented verdict. The sitting U.S. president's son found guilty of three felonies. And now you can show me, yeah. And that's what happens, and it's very difficult for me. Plus, legendary singer Celine Dion opens up about her health and her career. And what SpaceX is doing in Saskatchewan. I'm afraid we're not able to make any other comments. Removing space junk that fell from the sky and landed on farmland. Those pieces are huge. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. The small Newfoundland town immortalized in a hit musical seen by theater goers around the world was once again the site of a massive detour, except this time passengers couldn't even step out of the airport to take a gander. More than 240 passengers were forced to spend the night on benches and floors after the United Airlines flight they were on from Washington's Dulles Airport to Paris diverted because of a mechanical issue. But even though Canada Border Services says agents were on duty, only the 12 crew members aboard the 777 were processed and permitted to leave. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on the jarring journey for passengers. They came from away and were kept at bay, including Taylor Katie and her family. We just felt like, wow, our, our freedom has been revoked for the evening. In the early morning hours yesterday, United Airlines Flight 915 from Washington to Paris was flying over the North Atlantic when a reported mechanical issue was flagged by the pilot. They said that we had lost one of the hydraulic systems in the plane um, and that we were making an emergency landing. You have two young children on that flight with you. You hear the words emergency landing. What goes through your mind in that moment? I grabbed my son's knee even though he was sleeping and just kind of said a quick prayer. Looked at my husband and he was like mouthing to me it was going to be fine. And then I started crying a little bit. Thankfully, the plane carrying 268 passengers as well as 12 crew members landed safely in Gander, Newfoundland. The same town played host to hundreds of travelers whose flights were sent there during 9-11. The community, they'll rally for us if this is a big emergency. Though the weary travelers received a less than accommodating welcome from Canada Border Service agents. CBSA officers cleared the flight's crew through customs. However, passengers were not leading to 14 uncomfortable hours in the airport. There are people like in wheelchairs with neck braces who are on the flight, like way worse off than we were. In a statement, Border Services admits that while the request to clear passengers was made on site, it was not appropriately actioned. Going on to say the CBSA extends its sincere apologies to the passengers for any inconveniences experienced. The CBSA job in such a situation is to actually clear those passengers as quickly as possible to enter Canada. There was no security concern here. It embarrasses us as Canadians internationally too. The airport CEO confirms that CBSA staff have a 24 hour a day presence at Gander International. The good news, United finally sent a plane to pick everyone up and they've since arrived safely in Paris. Omar. Likely relieved to have reached their final destination. All right, Adrian, thank you. The union representing 9,000 border workers says a strike plan for midnight Friday will be averted after it reached a tentative deal with the federal government. Members still need to vote on the deal, and the union says it will share those details on Thursday. A key vote on the Liberals' plan to increase the capital gains inclusion rate passed today with the backing of the NDP and Bloc Québécois. The Conservatives voted against. Joining us now is CTV's chief political correspondent, Vashi Capellos. And Vashi, by essentially extracting a part of the federal budget and forcing a vote on the capital gains changes separately, the Liberals have pushed the Conservatives to take a position on the matter. What's the political strategy here and the impact? 
Yeah, that's exactly what they wanted to do. They want to wedge this issue with the Conservatives. They want to be able to frame the Tories as friendly to wealthier Canadians and less friendly to the rest of Canada. Here's how Christopher Freeland, the Minister of Finance, pushed back against the fact or the, the concern that this actually goes further than just going after the wealthy. According to our calculations, 0.13% of Canadians will pay more every single year based on these measures. Now, behind the scenes, I know Conservatives were split on this. They ultimately decided to vote against the measure. Here's why, according to Pierre Polyev. A job-killing tax on health care, homes, farms and small businesses is the last thing we need in this cost of living crisis the Prime Minister has caused. Two big questions out of this, Omar. Will the Conservatives get any political pain or pain in the polls due to the way they ended up voting on this? And will the Liberals actually make any headwinds with the strategy that they've employed? Unfortunately, you know it's always true, time will be the bearer of what tells us happens here. All right, Vashi, thank you. And staying in Ottawa, a federal party leader who has read the unredacted version of an explosive intelligence report into foreign interference said today there is no list of sitting MPs who have been disloyal to Canada. Her comments come as allegations are emerging of another foreign interference campaign. Here's CTV's Judy Trin. Top secret version of this. The Green Party leader has seen the unredacted National Security Parliamentary Report and says there's no list of MPs who have betrayed Canada. I'm just begging my colleagues, particularly the leaders of the other parties, not to let this descend into a witch hunt. The report suggested that some sitting MPs and senators were under the influence of China and India during the last two elections. May says less than a handful of compromised politicians may have received money during their nomination campaigns. She says the case of one witching MP who tried to arrange a meeting in a foreign country with an intelligence official is a big red flag. That person should be fully investigated and prosecuted. That person is a former MP. Elizabeth May uh, took on her responsibilities as party leader, uh, got her security clearance and did the work. Mr. Polyev should do that too. Unlike the Bloc and NDP leaders, Pierre Polyev doesn't intend on viewing the report, but he did vote with the overwhelming majority of MPs to ask Justice Marie-José Hogue to expand her public inquiry to look into the latest allegations. Some want the country of Israel scrutinized by the public inquiry too. Both Meta and OpenAI removed hundreds of fake accounts like this one. Palestine is the land of Islam. Some of the accounts came from Israeli IP addresses and were used to sway public opinion on the war in Gaza. This analyst says this is the new form of foreign interference. And it is uh, an issue that has been addressed to a degree by Justice Hoke so far, but, but I don't think substantially enough. Global Affairs is investigating the Islamophobic social media accounts and has conveyed its concerns to the Israeli government. But at this point, officials can't say definitively that this disinformation campaign is state-sponsored. Omar. All right, Judy, thanks. McGill University is offering to review its investments into weapons manufacturers and grant amnesty to protesters as part of a new offer made to members of a pro-Palestinian encampment who've been on part of the campus for more than six weeks. They're demanding the Montreal University cut ties with companies protesters say are complicit in what they call the genocide of Palestinians. McGill says the offer of amnesty does not extend to those who occupied an administration building last week. For the first time in history, the child of a sitting U.S. president has been criminally convicted. Hunter Biden was found guilty today of three felonies related to a handgun he purchased while addicted to drugs in 2018. His choice to lie on a government form when he bought a gun and the choice to then possess that gun. It was these choices and the combination of guns and drugs that made his conduct dangerous. The president, who has already said he will not pardon his son, embraced him after the verdict, saying in a statement that he accepts the outcome of the case. Hunter Biden releasing his own statement, saying, I am more grateful today for the love and support I experienced this last week than I am disappointed by the outcome. Biden faces a maximum of 25 years in prison, though because he is a first-time offender with no criminal history, 
he will likely get less than that. And for more, CTV News political analyst Eric Ham joins me now. Eric, looking ahead to the U.S. election in November, this race is now between a former president, now convicted felon, and a sitting president whose son has also been convicted. What impact, if any, will this have on the campaign trail? Well, we're already beginning to see the impact. In fact, Donald Trump and Joe Biden have already seen a 17-point swing in the polls. And now most polls are actually beginning to show Joe Biden with a very small lead. So it's clear that Donald Trump's conviction is already having impact. As far as what is happening with Hunter Biden, I suspect that we'll begin to see more empathy for Joe Biden, and that's likely to have at least damaging impact for the president, at least currently. And for Hunter Biden, he has another trial coming up in September. Remind us what that case is about. Well, that is a criminal tax evasion charge that was actually brought by the Department of Justice. And one of the reasons why we saw this plea agreement that was, a, that was worked on last year fall apart is because it didn't cover both the gun charge and the tax evasion charge. And now what we're seeing is where this could get very interesting for Hunter Biden uh, because he was convicted on this gun charge, if convicted in the tax evasion charge, then he will actually have a conviction. And, of course, that charge brings with it 17 years, uh, which he could be looking at facing some of that time with this conviction over this gun charge. All right, Eric, thank you. A man who doused a stranger in lighter fluid before setting her on fire on a Toronto bus was found not criminally responsible today for the killing. CTV's Sean Leethong has more on the attack and what happens next. It was a moment of horror. A woman set on fire while sitting on a bus, dying more than two weeks later. Now, almost two years afterwards, her killer is found not criminally responsible. He feels terrible. The whole situation is terrible, and I want to make that very clear. This is a very sad situation for everybody. Tenzin Norbu was charged with first-degree murder in the death of 28-year-old Naima Dalma after the event took place in June of 2022. In her decision today, Justice Maureen Forstell outlined the details, saying, Mr. Norbu's action on June 17, 2022, were rooted in his long-standing delusions and disorganization. He held a delusional belief at the time of the offense that Miss Dolma was recording him or had seen video of him. That was grounded in his delusions about the Tibetan community. He had a, a belief against an entire group of people um, that was not founded in anything. Norbu boarded the bus at Kipling Station, sitting behind Miss Dolma. The decision goes on to say, Mr. Norbu asked Miss Dolma if she was Tibetan. She replied yes. After her response, Mr. Norbu rummaged through the bag he carried and retrieved a jar of lighter fluid. He intentionally poured lighter fluid onto Miss Dolma and ignited the lighter fluid. Dolma tried to run away, suffering burns to 60% of her body and an inhalation injury. She died 18 days later. After his arrest, Norbu was assessed by a forensic psychiatrist, with Justice Forstel saying, it is clear from the evidence before me that Mr. Norbu had a disease of the mind, namely schizophrenia, at the time of the offense. The decision noting that Norbu had previously been treated for depression and had not been accurately diagnosed with schizophrenia until after the attack. When asked if they have a message for the victim's family, his lawyer said, I'm very sorry for your loss. I'm very sorry for what happened, but our client was a very sick man. His lawyer saying that their client is getting the help he needs now, and that has allowed him to have some insight into what he did. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News, Toronto. We are hearing tonight from a Canadian musical icon whose voice is recognizable around the world. Ahead of a documentary about a health struggle that has robbed her of the instrument she has perfected for decades, Celine Dion says she knew something was wrong years before she sought out a diagnosis. CTV's Andrew Johnson on the superstar's battle and the new promise to her fans. My voice is the conductor of my life. When stiff person syndrome began to diminish that voice and Celine Dion struggled to sing. And now you can show me, yeah. And that's what happens and it's very difficult for me. She says she tried to hide her symptoms for more than a decade. Lying to the people who got me where I am today. I could not do it anymore. In an emotional new interview with NBC, Dion regrets trying to soldier on for so long. My husband as well was fighting for his own life. I had to raise my kids. I had to hide. I had to try to be a hero. Now she's trying to overcome the rare autoimmune disorder she revealed publicly in 2022 that involves debilitating muscle spasms and cramping. 
it's like somebody strangling you. It's like somebody's pushing your larynx pharynx this way. Oh. So it's like you're talking like that and you cannot go high or lower. The condition at its worst, literally bone crushing. I had broken ribs at one point. The 56-year-old pop icon's fight for her life and her voice involves physical therapy and medication. She is adamant the show, her show, will go on. I'm going to go back on stage, even if I have to crawl, not just because I have to or because I need to, it's because I want to, and I miss it. Dion's journey is being chronicled in a documentary streaming on Prime later this month as her determination to return to the stage inspires millions. A return she insists is a matter of when, not if. Andrew Johnson, CTV News, Vancouver. Coming up, a long wait. It's um, been difficult. The new timeline to fix a water main in Calgary. Plus, SpaceX comes to collect in Saskatchewan. The goalpost for Calgarians hoping for a return to normal shifted again today. Now the city says residents can expect limitations on their water use to last into next week when there will be another update on repairs to a ruptured water main. Here's CTV's Kathy Lee. This is a welcome chore for Ray Johnston. He had no water for a few days and then once it was restored, his community was under a boil water advisory. It's... Um uh, been difficult because we've had at the same time 11 visitors. A break in a feeder main near Boness that's impacting Calgary and some neighboring communities and a small water main break on Johnston's street are the culprits for the water woes. Angry. <laughs> I think uh, that, that that was pretty much a universal attitude of the 21 people on these two blocks who were affected. For everyone else, a fire ban and water restrictions are still in place. That means no using water outdoors and limiting use indoors. Each day, your efforts have managed to save us the equivalent of about 50 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of water. More water will still need to be conserved. The city says the repair for the feeder main is taking longer than expected. The last two sections of the damaged pipe were removed and a robot was sent down to assess the extent of the damage. This afternoon, we are deploying a second robot that will travel even further in the pipe in both directions to see more sections of the pipe. This will help us determine if there, there are any additional issues that we should be aware of. While crews aim to fix the pipe by Thursday, the boil water advisory has now been lifted for Boness, but people living in the area are cautious. When we pour the water, it's still coming out with a weird color and there's chunks in it. It still looked a little bit nasty. I don't have the most faith that it is exactly fine. The city says it could take up to next week before they can determine when the water restrictions can be phased out. Kathy Lee, CTV News, Calgary. Still ahead, the spectacular display of nature off Vancouver Island. Female tennis legend Billie Jean King was on hand today to announce this year's number one draft pick for the Professional Women's Hockey League. New York selects Sarah Fillier. Canadian national team forward Sarah Fillier was taken with the first pick overall. The 24-year-old from Georgetown, Ontario brings an impressive resume to New York. Fillier has an Olympic gold medal and three world championships, not to mention a degree in psychiatry from Princeton University. Keeping it out, but now Natalie Spooner shoots, she scores! And PWHL Toronto's Natalie Spooner won this year's Billy Jean King MVP award. Spooner is from Ontario and has played for years on the national team. She led the PWHL in scoring with 20 goals. Whale watchers off British Columbia were treated to an up-close look at some of the ocean's most majestic inhabitants. Nearly two dozen killer whales were spotted in the Salish Sea 
off the southern tip of Vancouver Island, traveling slowly in a tight formation. The amazing video was shot by a pair of field biologists with the Center for Whale Research on Saturday, which just happened to be World Oceans Day. The first official portrait of King Charles was vandalized by protesters today at an art gallery in London. Animal rights activists used a paint roller to stick posters on the glass covering the monarch's face with a cartoon character with a speech bubble. They were asked to leave and a police report was filed. The portrait was not damaged and is no stranger to controversy. It drew mixed reaction when it was unveiled at Buckingham Palace last month. After the break, the waste from space. SpaceX retrieves a once-in-a-lifetime find from Saskatchewan. SpaceX is known for going above and beyond, but today there was a much simpler mission here on the ground in Canada, a recovery mission for pieces of debris on a farm in Saskatchewan. CTV's Alison Bamford explains. Wow. Spring cleaning has never drawn a crowd quite like this at the Sawchuck farm. It's interesting to... to see people's reaction to something out of the nor or ordinary. But on this day, Barry Sawchuck is finally clearing out the junk that he's stored in his shop for months. Two SpaceX employees drove to southern Saskatchewan to retrieve the debris believed to be parts of the trunk from a Crew Dragon spaceship. Loading the pieces into a U-Haul to take back to their offices. I'm afraid we're not able to, uh, to make any other comments. SpaceX has not responded to several requests for comment from CTV News, but we do know these are just a handful of at least eight pieces found on five different farms that re-entered Earth's atmosphere in late February. I don't know where the other part of it is. And there's likely more. It appears that the uh, the carbon fiber layers that they're using are really good insulators, so it's not, not burning up completely. Some nearly three meters tall, others weighing 100 pounds. Those pieces are huge, right? What if it had fallen on Regina? What if it had fallen on Barry Sawchuk's house, right? Like it absolutely would have killed people. SpaceX told Sawchuk it's trying to prevent this from happening again. They came, they they realize there's an issue, so they're trying to deal with it. No longer in Sawchuck's hands, the farmer can get back to his fields after capturing a moment in history. Alison Bamford, CTV News, near Ituna, Saskatchewan. And that's a snapshot of this Tuesday. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching, and good night. Canada's number one newscast for excellence in journalism. We begin tonight with breaking news. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina, winner of the Canadian Screen Award for Best National Newscast. Watch weeknights at 11.